Ready. Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> okay, good evening. I'm Karen Provenza from Napa Bookmine, and I'm so pleased to be, see you here tonight for this very timely and important conversation. We are on the verge of the Supreme Court reversing Roe v. Wade. Abortion bans are spreading across our country. It's important to look back at a time when women had no choice. Napa author Meredith Keller is here to tell that story, a reminder of all we have to lose if we return to those times. The book is The Unraveling, The Price of Silence. It describes in vivid detail the moment she received a hand-scripted letter in her mailbox that said, I think you may be my grandmother. This shocking statement instantly dredged up shattering memories, flashbacks at blinding speed of sexual assault, isolation, pain, severance, and shame. She writes, there was the promise of closure to a nightmare that had also held the pain of reliving every, each and every episode of a tragic drama with secrets well hidden for 52 years. Tonight, we are honored to have with us her daughter, Anne Blair, who you'll meet in a moment who she gave up for adoption all those years ago. But before we begin a bit more about each woman, Meredith Keller honed her writing skills as a food editor of a leading restaurant magazine. She was also a copywriter for top advertising agencies, publicists and marketing executives. All this helped her articulate trauma and the emotional topography of sexual assault and the blistering consequences. She is also an artist, giving her depth of expression as her canvas and drawing related drawings related back to her early personal trauma. And you actually see one on the cover of her book. Her birth daughter, Anne Blair, is a nurse practitioner and a teacher who spent her childhood writing letters never mailed to an unknown mother. That longing, that mystery clearly has been solved. So happy to be here tonight with you. And it must be uh, somewhat miraculous for the two of you. It is. <laughs> we're in, we talk at least once a week. So we're, we've been very close ever since we had the original meeting. And we're gonna hear more about how that unfolded in a moment. I, I do wanna say after reading your book, I had a renewed appreciation for how significantly our world had changed for women in the few short years that separate us. I entered college in 75, armed with access to birth control and the right to an abortion, but still struggling with shame and self-blame. And I think women of any generation will relate to that and many of the other themes in your personal story. But Meredith, let's begin tonight by you putting your story in that context of the time period and how very different it was um, to, from now. Well, I, I really don't think many younger women, I mean, younger teenagers in 20s and 30s can even begin to comprehend that period that um, I and so many others lived through. But when I think about it, history doesn't record emotions, trauma, grief, and pain. History will record dates, times, trends, movements. And we know about movements, but we don't really understand the total complexity of what people felt in any one time. And there's the best example I can think of is um, uh, when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote uh, The Scarlet Letter. We did not know about those times, but he brought it up close and added all the muscle to the bones of the story of those times when women had to sew that little A into their clothes for adultery. So I wanted to bring to full born focus what those times felt like that are, are really called um, the baby scoop era. It, was, it began the year I was born, 1940, and it lasted uh, until Roe v. Wade or until abortion was made legal. But in that period of time, um, society had women in their grip. If they had an unintentional pregnancy and if they happened to be single, they had only very few choices. And obviously the one that wasn't afforded them was abortion, but there were many as we now know, illegal abortions 
and botched abortions. And I always thought those were just wive tales when you heard about coat hangers, et cetera. But women died, many women died. In fact, <clears throat> in the year that I'm going to write, did write about 1962, um, in Harlem Hospital, there were 1600 cases of botched or incomplete abortions in just one year. So poor women didn't have the options, probably, I'm guessing, of going to the maternity homes where women were uh, afforded this opportunity, as you, if you want to call it that, of you know, bearing a child, taking it to term, but they were told that they would have to relinquish it for adoption. And in that period of time, that I'm talking about, there were 4 million families that put up uh, babies for adoption. And so there was a lot of trauma, a lot of pain, not just at the moment of birth, which I fully experienced, but trauma for the families and trauma, which I'm now beginning to understand for the adoptees. It was a horrible solution to a problem to you know, force women to take a child to term and then snatch the babies away. But that was the baby scoop era. And that's the one um, that I wanted to amplify so that people really felt what those decisions were. We had no decisions. They were given to us. Um, it was a very different time from when you grew up because there was so much conformity, so much shame uh, divorce was taboo. Everything was taboo. So it was a very, very um, perplexing, sad time. But my journey through all of that actually was rather hopeful. I, I learned a lot of skills um, of how to, you know, survive in that kind of situation. But my whole journey began um, from one single incident my senior year in college, in a campus, and it turned my whole life upside down. Well, before you get into that, and uh, we will ask you to sort of take us through your experience, the act of writing this book came about from receiving a, a very important letter. And I know um, the letter writers are on this call tonight, and maybe if they take themselves off mute, they can say a quick hello, and then you can to take us through that moment of, well, anyone who wants to share in that moment is welcome to it. That's the author of, of the uh, letter. And I have the letter here. You don't want to be in the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. You've done all this. Hi. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm uh, the granddaughter of the letter writer. writer. The letter writer. And you've done that. Oh, here, let's Is Robbie a letter writer? <laughs> Robbie isn't muted. Ma Robbie, stay on mute. <laughs> so, uh, Beatrice, was that you who was? It was me. It was you. And your sister's on the call as well. Yeah, my sister Kate is on the call as well. I, the decision to write the letter was kind of something that we had agreed upon. Um, we had said like, okay, you know, do, do we, do we want to sort of start this ball rolling? And uh, I kind of got uh, nominated as, as the letter writer of the three of us. And I'd be happy to read it because I have it right in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go right ahead. Okay. So I will explain where I was in time when this letter arrived. It was probably the most peaceful time of my life. Uh, retired, painting, very relaxed. And I picked up the mail out of my rural box and I was intrigued by the card itself and the handwritten script on the front. And it was from someone I didn't know, someone from Austin. So I ripped it open, happy to see what would be inside. I read halfway through and I'll tell you where I stopped. Um, it said, dear Mrs. Meredith, I did, I do not quite know how to begin. So I'll start by saying that I hope this letter will be welcome. It contains what I think may be big news. 
My mother, Anne, was born on December 1st, 1962 in the suburbs of Philadelphia. She was adopted by my grandparents who were two of the kindest and most loving people I know. My mother has wondered often about her origins, her birth parents, the life they've led, the sort of people they are. My sister and I have wondered as well. And a few years ago began exploring the internet to see what we could discover with what little we had to go on. It's in that search that led us to believe that you may be my mother's biological mother, my grandmother. And with that, the shock, it was just through my body and it brought up all of the pain that I thought was so successfully buried. All the pain just came all tumbling down at once on me and I threw the letter on the floor. And I thought, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that because now I have to go into that pain and bring it all back up and explain to uh, my son's granddaughters, you know, why I would give their daddy's daughter away, their daddy's sister away. And it was just a brief flash that all of that went through my head. And so I drove erratically up to the vineyard and found my husband and he's very cautiously and, and uh, carefully said, would you just read the letter again? And then I went through it and he said, well, how do you know that's authentic? And I thought, well, I don't. So I uh, contacted my son who was in technology at the time, always multitasking. And my text, my, it wasn't a text, it was an email. I said, the letter that I thought would come one day did. And within minutes, I get a phone call. And he said, mom, what's the letter? What, what, do you, what is it? And I told him we needed a little bit more information. He said, give me a few minutes. He came right back within a few minutes with her maiden name. And I knew the maiden name. And so I thought, oh, this indeed is my daughter. And then I got really excited to know about the next phases. And because it was a uh, snail mail letter, no, no email uh, address whatsoever, I had to construct a response. And I sat down and I thought, how do I explain all that I went through and all about those times in one letter? I thought, it's just about impossible. So I started very carefully and I'm gonna have to look for the letter if I can find it. But in the meantime, B, you can go ahead and tell um, how you responded to my letter when it arrived. Yeah, so I'm, gonna jump, I'm gonna jump in Do it. As, as the mom <laughs> of me, of, of Beatrice. So I am, I'm in my hometown with my younger daughter, Kate, whose picture is not up right now. She is on with us. And I'm saying to Kate, well, we just haven't heard back on that letter. No, I guess this is a dead end. And I was very, I was upset because it had been a couple of weeks. So she said, well, we better call Beatrice and just ask her. So I called Beatrice and said, hey, you didn't get anything in your mailbox, did you? And Jennifer, <laughs> I haven't really checked my mailbox for <laughs> 10 days. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, hey. and my heart starts pounding as she's like, oh, let me check it now. And you know, <laughs> standing there on the other end of the phone. And she's like, oh, there's a letter in my mailbox. And I'll let you <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, yes, I uh, was not amazing at checking my mailbox at my apartment extremely regularly. My husband now has taken over this duty for me. Um, I've, you know, going to the box and getting in the letter. So I went to the box this day and was like, oh, what would you know? I actually got a very prompt response to this letter. Uh, and I, I, I still, I was just going through all of my sort of collection of special letters and cards just the other day. And I had seen this letter and, um, uh, you may have a, a, a copy of it there to read, but, I can't um, find it at the minute, but I know I have it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was just, it was just the the sweetest letter we had, we had, you know, thought like, okay, you know, this is, this is kind of a shot in the dark. 
this is, you know, maybe going to be a letter that's never answered. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, we were fully aware that this was going to maybe uh, bring up some, some memories for, you know, a person who hadn't thought about this, maybe, you know, hadn't been at the top of mind for a while. Uh, but I was just so, and, you know, we, cause I was, I was literally on the phone at this time, like checking the mail on the phone uh, on a conference call. We're so pleased to, to hear back and hear like, yes, you know, like, I think I am your grandmother, you know, I, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of letter writing back and forth, yeah. slowly getting to know each other in terms of, you know, where they had lived, what they had done. And there were a lot of similarities that um, were fun to, to realize. Um, but it also, as you have very point, pointedly said, it brought you back to some very painful memories and um, your book, starts with us knowing that the letter arrived, but most of it really does dive into um, your experience and the trauma of it. And you feel as, a, as an offering to your, your granddaughters um, from your, your birth daughter and your son as well, that, that, and to all of us here on the call. So I, I feel a little bit horrible asking you to, to take us there, but I think you need to for us to really understand the importance of your work. Well, um, after a flurry of letters back and forth, I realized there was so much more information that I simply couldn't put in a letter. And I sat down and started constructing um, maybe chapters of my Chicago years and various points of my life. And I was not starting with the birth. I was starting back and going forward. And the more that I started through this whole experience and reliving um, the rape that led to the pregnancy, it was all a puzzle. There were fragments of many different things uh, floating around in my mind, and they weren't making sense, but I continued to write. The more I wrote, the more I understood the fragments, the more I understood that there was a lot of repressed pain that need, needed to come out. So the um, computer had tears on many afternoons when I'm sitting there recalling the exact details. And it was at that point in time that I thought this needs to be a book. This needs to be a story that uh, had to be told because I hadn't read one at this point in time of that period in time. There are a few others out there now. In fact, uh, it's rather interesting. The woman who wrote the Baby Scoop Initiative um, signs her letters, Sisters in Suffering. And so there is a community of people out there that have experienced and tried to write about it and tried to document um, exactly what that period was like. Um, but for me, it was not only cathartic, it was just amazing to see all the pieces come together and for me to have such closure. And again, we had not even started, we had not even met. We had just been exchanging letters. And so there was great anticipation as we knew we were leading up to a fall gathering. And Anne and I wanted to meet together. Uh, personally, before the, the girls were introduced. And so I set aside this night that we would get together, this great anticipation of when she and I would be together and I would open the door and see my long lost daughter. And for Anne, she had similar um, questions. And Anne, do you remember the script of what you had written on the plane? Uh, on your way there. Oh, I had it and I can't find it. But I you know, know what? I, I know I wrote a script and I know I gave it to you. I, I want to talk more about just briefly um, as we're anticipating getting ready for this time when you and I would meet for the first time. We had a phone call. Um, so the letter came back to us probably around Memorial Day. And then we had a 
phone call on the 4th of July. And to me, this is this kind of brings in the whole being adopted piece. Um, Meredith agreed with, with her son and her husband that we would get on this group phone call with myself, Beatrice, my daughter, Kate. I had flown to, I just happened to be flying down to Austin for the 4th of July and Kate was gonna be back in Philadelphia. Anyways, we got on this call, uh, Meredith's husband started the call and then Meredith started to speak and I just flooded in tears. And Beatrice kind of looked at me and you know we just kept going. And when we got off the phone, the only thing I could say, because I was so choked up, was I know that voice. And she said, oh, she sound like someone. I said, no, 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 you don't get it. I know that voice. I remember, there's something deep visceral in my body. I remember that voice. And we both from, I'm a women's health nurse practitioner originally before going on to be family and geriatric, that, you know, the baby does hear the mom in utero. And she was talking after I was born. I from reading her book, you know, she talked to me as she was talking me over. And so that voice was there and it was something that deep down was a connection that I all of a sudden realized I had missed. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, I, this might be an appropriate moment if you're up to it, Meredith, to read page 85, the, the chapter you called The Severance. Um, oh, right. That's if I don't cry. I know. I, I, I sort of feel like <laughs> I'm the evil doer tonight. Okay. Read the tragic trauma part. <laughs> but I think um, it's appropriate with what Anne said, that the connection that you were feeling right. to one well, another in that moment. Just to, as a backdrop to this, um, and it's, I state in the book that <clears throat> my sister was my coach. She said, this is a very unfortunate thing that's happened to you. You need to pretend like this is some, only a physical thing you're going to go through. You have to steal yourself. You don't even want to look at the baby because you will want it. You have to, and that was the mantra of the times. You're going to have this child, you're going to walk away, and you're going to forget that ever happened. That was, that was the way it was set up. However, the nurse, this is you know from my book, the nurse brought in baby Ann, swaddled in a pink blanket, and gently placed her in my lap. I was afraid to meet Ann's lies, but looked into them one last time before wrapping her up snugly against the below zero weather outside. The nurse informed me in an almost ceremonial way that we would roll down a long ramp to a parking lot to the waiting parents. The whole process seemed like an eternity. I was shivering with anxiety, and the frost on the windows didn't help. When we were ready, I pulled up the blanket to cover her face from the bitter cold. No one can imagine the gravity and the deep sadness of the moment you give away your own child. Even though I had steeled myself well for her birth, the very act of handing Ann over caused a quake deep in my soul. It was an act of severance between mother and child, but I was trying to be optimistic. This would be a wonderful new beginning for Anne, I had hoped that the two strangers waiting at the bottom of the ramp were her new loving parents. But when I was wheeled up to them, they merely nodded. In fact, they were not her adoptive parents, but legal representatives. The tears were flowing freely now when I pulled the blanket down and kissed her goodbye. It was beyond sadness. It was crushing my soul. The waiting woman picked up Anne and I watched as she turned to leave with the new bundle. As the wheel returned <clears throat> up the ramp, I felt my heart thumping, a sharp pain stabbed at me. That was the most sorrowful moment of my life. Even though I can recall it with crystal clarity, mostly I keep it sealed away, compartmentalized, forever afraid to revisit that. So that's, that depth of emotion is there when every woman has a child. To create this severance, and pretend that this didn't happen was cruel. And that's why I'm hoping that we can spotlight this time and spread that word so that people will understand this is not the solution to no birth control or whatever the laws they're you know, uh, bringing together for the states now. Well, that's a, that's a really, uh 
terrifying uh, place that we find ourselves in now because we, we can no longer read your book and feel as though it's something that remains in the past. I mean, I think what has changed dramatically, and I do want to talk about you know, how it was different then and what has changed now and what, what hasn't. I mean, one of the things that on the positive note, it's, it's much easier for these reunions to occur because we have access to uh, DNA testing and, and the internet. So that's made this, this wonderful reunion possible, but many things have not changed for, as you said, a specific uh, group of women in particular who don't have access to birth control or abortion if that's their choice, yeah. Well, you know, and, and one point um, also is even though I wrote the book and I wanted to get together, there are many women who probably would find it way too painful to open that Pandora's box because there, there is so much pain connect to why, why they, who they were with and why. And um, American Baby, which uh, is a book that was written within the last year, takes one couple through their whole life. And they were a young couple who actually, as teenagers, loved each other, thought they would get married. When she was pregnant, the parents said, oh, no, 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 that's not happening. You're not getting married and you're not having this child. So they, they persevered. Uh, two years later, they married. They had a family and they spent the rest of their time looking for that lost child. So some of them really wanted to, to keep their babies. That wasn't always um, that they were snatched for adoption. There were many, many painful stories. Mm -hmm. Well, you wrote this book and you end with um, a list of, I don't, I don't know if you, what do we call them? Not lessons, but... Um, important takeaways for your granddaughter. Uh, and I, let me just throw a, f a couple out there and anyone who wants to respond, not my fault. That's uh, the first one. Do you wanna speak a little bit to that? Um, yes, very definitely. So again, in 1962 uh, on a college campus, the setting for this rape was uh, a, a college um, setting at a college bar after finals. And the people in that bar were people I all knew. We were seniors. You couldn't be in the bar if you weren't a senior. So I knew all of them, or most of them, fairly well, and I felt comfortable. What, what was shocking to me at the time, and I didn't realize it until I was writing the book, I always thought it was my fault for being there. What I didn't understand was that he had brought me something to drink. I don't remember a thing beyond the drink that arrived and putting all the pieces together and researching a little, I found that the flashbacks are trauma and you cannot piece together what happened. So that when victims of rape go to the police department, they say what happened? Well, I think it was this, I'm not sure it was that. They just write it off as they don't know. But that's trauma. And so there were a lot of things like that that I learned. And one of the biggest things was that um, date rape is something that was never even in our lexicon then. You wouldn't even think that somebody would take you to their fraternity, which was absolutely uh, verboten for any woman to be there. And I finally, uh, understood it wasn't my fault. And other, other factors um, uh, came to bear. Uh, the woman who had been a roommate of mine at the time said, when I came home, I was semi-conscious. They couldn't even get me up the stairs. But she said it wasn't alcohol. There was no alcohol. But nobody knew to think about rape kits or rape. It just wasn't part of our scene in 1962. Yes, and unfortunately, that circumstance that you describe is not something couched in the past. It's very much a part of our, our current environment for students on campus still to this day. Um, you mentioned also just that um, idea of shame. 
and how that is used to um, control women. Oh, very definitely. <clears throat> That's age old. It goes back to Nathaniel Hawthorne's time, the mm -hmm. book he wrote about. Mm -hmm. And the other thing you mentioned that uh, I found really hopeful, and I think it's the reason we have so many people on this call tonight, is the power of storytelling. And um, talk a little bit about that. And then this would be a, a good time if you do have a question that you want to put in chat. I am going to quickly put in chat how to get the book and how to contact Meredith. Um, but start thinking if you want to ask a question or if you feel like sharing something, but uh, answer that question now, Meredith. How, how has storytelling? I, I am so hoping that um, if there were 4 million um, adoptions that took place in that period of time, there are 4 million stories out there. And I am so hoping that people will, like the Me Too movement, begin to share them and create a bigger and broader understanding. Now, my situation would be totally different from you know, others. I, mine was complicated with rape and pregnancy. The pregnancies happened for many, many reasons, but they all suffered the same bad detritus. And I can remember reading about one young woman who came down and told her parents about the uh, pregnancy. And the next morning they said, what happened? We took you to church, didn't we? <laughs> Little understanding of the complexity of the world that they were living in even then. And I think it's a good thing for um, mothers who have teenage daughters to start talking about some of the things that are in that book and to start allowing them to be empowered and think of how to protect themselves. My dad, and that was one of the saddest um, parts of the book when I had to tell my own father, because he would give me um, what he called um, um, protection money. So if you're out on a date, you always have to have protection money, a way to get home, a way to escape if you have to. And then I had to sit there and tell him, well, it didn't work this one time. So it was sort of painful to tell your own father what, what had happened. But there's so many stories like this that I would encourage women to um, bring forward. I would love to invite um, Beatrice and Anne to perhaps reflect on a part of uh, Meredith's story that resonates with you specifically or that you connect with specifically or can decide who wants to jump in first or who wants to just I'll, ignore I'll go that first. I'll, <laughs> I'll go first because I'm older, Beatrice. <laughs> so I was, I was given the story from my parents that uh, Meredith and her boyfriend were very much in love, but they were in college and that she was going to keep this baby, but at the last minute she decided that she couldn't because my mom and dad were for, were, had moved recently back to the area that was their hometown and they sat in the doctor's office every week with my older sister getting her allergy shots unbeknownst these two pregnant women sitting there one of them being Meredith and one of them being my one of my friend Glade's moms um, was sitting there and, and probably about four weeks before I was born the doctor approached my mom and said hey would you like to adopt a baby and my mom, who had wanted to conceive again and had a six-year-old child had not conceived again, said, oh, yes, absolutely. So this whole idea of that this young college girl, how did she get there? She must have been in love. And then sitting down in San Francisco that first, the morning after I arrived the night before, and Meredith telling me about what was really not a date rape, because they weren't on a date. It was an acquaintance rape just upset me deeply because then I realized this woman who I thought had been, which I still think was so very brave, had been so very hurt. And I didn't carry that through my whole life when I thought about her because I didn't know. Here I thought she was in love and it just didn't work out. And actually because of what happened to her, <laughs> I didn't have sex with any of my boyfriends when I was in high school <laughs> or even college because I wasn't ready for 
I came from a, a very religious town that believed in hereditary evils and told me that I was evil because she had a baby with a boy. And so it scared the heck out of me because I knew that I couldn't give up a child. And when I had my first daughter, I think I gained even more respect for Meredith because I realized how well she had taken care of her, her body and herself during that pregnancy, knowing very well that this was not going to be, you know, she was not doing this for something that was putting a lot into something she was going to have for the rest of her life. And that took a lot. And there's no way I think I could have given up a child. And thank goodness, Beatrice, you are here. And Kate, you're here because I didn't do that. But it was because of Meredith's strength to get us to that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, um, I guess, most struck by two things. Number one, um, I, I just feel like we are such similar people, even though we only got to know Meredith, uh, you know, after we were basically adults. Um, I just think that there is something that is very uh, hereditary about, uh, you know, like, being a person I don't know like I'm I'm a very artistic person I love to express myself with words I feel like that has definitely carried down um I also am very struck by how far we have come as a society since the 1960s um you know, my, my generation and, you know, hopefully generations after me and hopefully even the folks who came a little bit before me have, have had an opportunity to make uh, decisions for themselves about whether they're going to go through this really, really emotional experience of having a baby, regardless of you know, whether they keep that baby or give that baby up for adoption or, you know, any other option. Um, you know, now living in the state of Texas uh, at this particular time, I'm, hey, <laughs> I'm thinking about that particularly. It is really bone shaking to think that I now live in a state where like, the progress that we have made to be able to make that decision is uh, sort of backtracking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kate, I see that you have your hand raised. I'm going to ask to you take yourself off mute and ask your question. Well, um, sorry, I was having technical difficulties earlier. I don't know if y'all can hear me very well. Um, but I had a question kind of on the coattails of, of my mother uh, kind of describing the her kind of ideas of who Meredith was as this kind of mythical figure almost uh, in her childhood. Uh, one, one thing that was was that she definitely got very wrong was had this idea that Meredith was 100% Irish, which oh, we yeah. found out later was not the case. But I'm wondering for you, Mayor, uh, did you have any sort of kind of fantasy of, of where that baby had ended up? Or is that something that you just was, was very painful to even think about? I, I did often think that because the community was so tight, everybody that um, I interfaced with when I was with uh, uh, having the baby um, were all of the same faith. And I know that they traveled in the same circle. So I always assumed it was someone in the circle. What I didn't realize that it was uh, that, you know, that your uh, granddad, um, was the brother of the family that I knew well. And I had spent a wonderful Thanksgiving with them. And Anne was born December 1. So you can well imagine how pregnant I was for Thanksgiving. And I was feeling so cumbersome and odd and, you know, just sort of out of sorts. 
And this family came again in and surrounded the, ta the table and lifted their glass and toasted me with a song that was so touching and warm. And they just made me feel part of this big clan. So I always thought it was probably someone within the clan. I just didn't know who. They were actually brothers, but the interesting thing was my grandparents, my dad's parents, and Aunt Alice and Uncle Frank, who took care of you, were best friends. Yeah. And they kept my grandma, Beatrice, they kept away from her that they were getting a baby so that she did not know until that bundle that you talked about wrapping up arrived at the house. She had no idea because they were living with her while my, their house was being built. She had no idea a baby was coming. And Aunt Alice never talked about, oh, I have a girl living with me that's having a baby. Oh, huh. fun. Interesting. I feel like we're all participating in this reunion tonight. It's really wonderful to have the entire group of women that are now reunited with us. Um, there's been so much interest in your book. There, uh, we've had, we have 45 people on the call. I invite you now to ask a question or tell us why you're here, um, what, how this is resonating with you personally. You could either, at this point, let's, let's do the hand raising thing. That might be the easiest, or you could put your question in chat and I can ask it for you. So we have about uh, just 10 more minutes together. So this is our chance. Okay, Kate, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Kate Cunningham. Yes, hi. 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 Hi, hi Meredith. Kate. Hi, Anne. Hi, Beatrice and the other Kate. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I was wondering about Meredith's son and how that um, all went and, and how it went for Meredith telling him and how it went for you all meeting him and if he's here now and. Well, originally I had told him um, when he was about 21 and it's in the book that, you know, I'd been to one of his uh, homecoming sessions at Berkeley and I thought, you know, there's a lot of alcohol flowing. There's a lot of women. It's time I had a little talk with him about what had happened in college for me. And it was one of the hardest talks to have, to explain and watch um, his face show that this was more information that he would like to have had about his mother. But he was very embracing and, and supportive. And when we had the meeting, when we all met for the first time in San Francisco, um, by then Billy had two daughters and they were eight and 11. And we weren't sure how we should explain this. So we didn't. And we just told them that um, they were going to meet some cousins. And the next day somebody asked what they did. And they said, well, we just, we went and had, met our cousins and we just had such a fun time. So I thought that was good. I wanted them to read the book, but their parents have decided they're going to wait until, um, they're just a tad older. So neither one of them have read the book. And they're, they have not been exposed to Anne because we haven't been able to share this history yet. And it's sort of sad to me because even though they're still young, I think that's the kind of story that needs to be told and you just move on. But I can't negate what the parents are thinking. Kira, uh, try to unmute and ask your question and Scott will go to you next. Kira, are you? I'm trying to find you on my screen. I've never had this many people on the screen at one time. Let me see if I can. Scott, why don't you ask, oh, Kira, is that you? No, so Scott, Go ahead and unmute Scott and ask your question. And then Kira, write yours in the chat and I'll ask it for you. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Meredith, in your book, you told the story that you talked to your father. It was painful. But then there was a, an extended sort of negotiation almost with 
the uh, young man and his family, at which you were, we went and met at a neutral location in a motel, I think. Uh, and in that meeting, the, the two fathers, in essence, talked and your father said, well, you know, the way we should do it, the way you should do it is, or at least the way it was done in my time, maybe, is the way you related it, was that you, uh, you should get married. Were you, at the time, do you remember at the time what you felt about that? Oh, uh, I, was, I was furious because um, my father uh, did not, you know, tip his hand that he was going to suggest that as a solution. Mm -hmm. I thought that we were going to meet these, uh, Pete and his father to have a negotiation about how to handle the birth of the baby and the financial arrangement. I thought that's what this was about because we had already met a lawyer. Uh, so when he came out with that, I was furious. Like, why would I even think about marrying someone? And again, everybody had perceived that it was a boyfriend. They just assumed that and it had not been. So they had me go into the adjoining hotel suite room and think about it for a while. And I thought for a few minutes and then I came out and I found my voice in a way for that period at that time was pretty strong. And I more or less said, I, how could I think of starting a marriage with someone where there's no love. And I okay. said, I'm perfectly able to handle this on my own. That's and an extraordinary part of the story is the mm -hmm. truth. But it, you, the way you've told it in the book, didn't quite get the full nuance of yeah. it. Do you, do you think your father basically hid it from you? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I do. I think, and I was so mad when I came back out, I slammed the car door because uh, he didn't level with me that that was a ploy or, or one of the things he had even thought about. So it was very upsetting uh, at the moment, but the whole occasion was so upsetting. It was just one more thing. Right. On top Thank, of you. Thank you. Um, Bianca, I see your hand is up, but I'm going to quickly uh, uh, read Kira's question from chat and then... Um, then Bianca, you can be next. So, hi Meredith, first I wanna say that my mom is just a bit younger than you and I told her about the book and she said that I thought it was the first book I read that really helped me understand the time in which she grew up. She was married at 22 after she thought she had to marry the man she had sex with and the trauma around her first marriage that was not due to assault but just lack of love resonated with your story. And my question is, what helped you process your trauma? What books did you read or people you spoke to? Or maybe I could share with my, so she could share with her mother um, your advice on that and, and have an opportunity to talk with her mother further. I, I did not read books or see a therapist or get any self-help of any kind. I think it was um, the feeling that I had to move on. I had to do this myself. I had moved out of state. I was just moving along and, and continually hiding my emotions of what had happened. So within a very short time of Anne's birth, I had met someone who actually wanted to marry me and kept referring to me as the good woman. That I could not process. I could not process how I was supposed to tell him about my my story it was too early too soon so there was no therapy no no one person to talk with i just kept moving along moving ahead but you do mention um when we spoke about uh, the coping strategies that that you developed later in life and um the art and well, definitely because my mother who had been so supportive of me, um, she and I would bond together in the kitchen in a way that was very warm. And when I feel down in any way, I go into the kitchen and start to cook. 
and usually something chocolate because that's what she would prefer to do when we were all uh, sitting around studying at night. She would have these chocolatey aromas filling the house. So that was a sort of a therapy for me. It would stabilize me. If I felt bad about something, I would just go cook. And that was my therapy. And Kira, I think it would be fair to say that there was something therapeutic about writing your story. And I would absolutely encourage your mother to get, get it out, put it down in writing. It doesn't have to be perfect, just has to be told and shared. Bianca, let's honor your hand and unmute and go ahead and ask your question. I can't hear her. She's yes. not unmuted. Unmute, please. Oh. Can you okay, there you go. Oh, sorry now about that. Hi, Meredith. This is um, Bianca Butler from Surveillance Magazine. I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to this event and for reaching out to me for my story. Um, I was really scared to tell my, tell my story. And when you reached out to me, that meant everything to me to let me know that, you know, I'm not alone in this journey of, of also wanting to find family. My biological grandmother also relinquished her twin daughters in the 60s and gave them up for adoption. And we also have a story of reunion. Um, so, but my question, Meredith, is what is your advice? Like you mentioned, there are 4 million women that experienced this during the baby scoop era. And there, that means there's 4 million stories. What is your advice to anybody else who wants to tell their family story of this period or write about these type of topics? Well, one thing I would do is read more from Severance Magazine, and you'll understand um, a lot of the pain from the adoptee's point of view, which is something I had not been exposed to um, prior to writing. But I would get to um, just good, get some good writing help, um, go to some classes. You'd be surprised how many um, stories will touch on part of this, because they're deep in everybody. It's just people don't like to share. They don't like to share what's really deep down bothering them. That's, that's kept in tight. But I've found a lot of sharing in some of my writing groups when people are writing about something that's incredibly important to them and how they do it and the skills they use to bring it out. And when I, I took uh, one uh, writing seminar, I remember distinctly, the, um, the instructor said, uh, you have to write till it hurts. You cannot be aware of hurting people's feelings or shading the truth. You have to write as it was until it hurts. And I really did internalize that. You, you have to do that. You have to really dig deep. Thank you. Thank you so much for telling the story. And um, thank you for reaching out to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. I don't see any, oh, one last question and then it'll be time for some final thoughts from our author and uh, her newfound family. So I'm seeing Miriam, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. My computer, there you go. I, uh, okay. Uh, hi, Meredith. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, good to see you, good to listen to you. And you may have told me this, but I don't remember if you kept a journal or if you just wrote after all this happened, uh, maybe not regularly, but here and there just um, had a feeling that maybe one day you might um, share this story and maybe you wrote some of it or parts of it or, or something. I, I don't remember if you told me that or not. Okay, so Miriam is my good friend from Evanston and I tearfully told the story to her one day and she said, you need to write this down. You need to get this out. You can't keep that inside. And she gave me a journal and she gave me another journal. She must have given me three or four journals over the time that I knew her. And I never did write one word down because- no, I meant before Meredith, before we even met, after this thing happened. Yeah, no, never. Never journaled, no. Never, it wasn't my habit 
to write down my feelings. It wasn't my habit to journal, but it um, writing the book when I saw how therapeutic it was and how wonderful that feeling is, I wondered why I hadn't. I don't know the answer to that, but I know you tried. No, no, I really meant from before, not when I tried. So when this happened, if, I mean, it's amazing that you remember so many details and everything, because I think journaling would have helped to a little bit. Yeah, it would have. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, you remembered and I remember. you did it and, and it's wonderful. <laughs> and you tried your best to get me to journal. Yeah, I know I did. <clears throat> yep. Wasn't my, wasn't into me then, but I would now. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I, I think it's too late. <clears throat> Before we get final thoughts, Scott is asking for some recipes and I'm going to have him reach out to you via email because he says he wants you to share something. Um, but let's do some final reflections, thoughts or just goodbyes from granddaughter's daughter and grandmother, mother. We'll, we'll start from the youngest and end with Meredith for final thoughts. Putting you on the spot. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, Scott I'm just... Not. I am just uh, so proud to have uh, Meredith as my grandmother. There was a very kind of instant, like, aha, you know, <laughs> an instant connection there of, you know, that I hadn't, hadn't experienced before. Um, and just am so inspired by your perseverance and, and, grittiness and resilience. I think that I have hopefully inherited a couple of those good qualities. That's so beautiful. That's lovely. It yeah. Is. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I would I would second that. I'm I'm also very very proud of you as uh, somebody who has really found some some enjoyment and comfort in writing as well for for you know making all the way through the process of writing it down end to end and publishing and now bringing us all here to to chat with you i'm 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 very uh happy to be included in that and Anne. and i first of all scott you need to get her chocolate biscotti recipe <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal she fed it to us when she first met us i have been trying to duplicate it i have her recipe but i, I just haven't done it the same way i am immensely happy to have meredith in my life in this writing process that she went through she sent me a couple drafts and after my mom was diagnosed with a recurrence of cancer i sat down with her probably in 2019 and read what Meredith had written. And it was a really interesting time for me to share it with my mom because everything Meredith said, she's like, oh yeah, the madras and oh, you know, the things about the 60s and references to books. You know, my mom was right there because she had lived through that probably about eight, nine years older than Meredith. And it meant a lot to her to hear her story. She was in tears as I was reading it to her. I didn't get through the whole thing because then at one point I started to tear up that I couldn't read my iPad. But I am immensely happy, Meredith, that you have, have published this for your granddaughters and for the generation that has had to go through hiding all these years. And when, when I found you, and it was Kate that actually found you, Kate, my daughter. When I actually found you, I, I sat on it for a while. I wasn't sure how to reach out to you because really I did not want to destroy your life. And when you just said you were in the best part of your life when this came along, that was my, as an adoptee, that was my biggest fear to just kind of knock you off your feet. So I wasn't sure if it was the right thing, but what really drove me to, to reach out was just to get some medical information because some medical stuff going on and that was the one piece I really needed. And what I got in return was phenomenal, and I am immensely grateful. Well, I can't tell you how proud I am of all of you and to know, you know, the impact we've all had, you know, on each other with this coming together. I only wish you all lived closer because I can't, you're all over the country and I can't see you enough. But 
it was such a warm, wonderful feeling to know that this closure had taken place. I wasn't guilty anymore and that I had these new people in my life to share. And it was just a gorgeous feeling all the way around, such, such warmth. And I'm sure that when my son's daughters read the book, they'll be embracing as well. I'm not sure why they're keeping it such a secret, but it needs to be, they'll be in the fold. All of them will be together as Billy was when he first met you and, and inter interacted with his letters as well. But it's been a beautiful experience for me. Beautiful. And for all of us here tonight, what a pleasure to meet you all and to hear your story. Uh, the hardship that ends with such a miraculous reunion is just a perfect way to launch the holiday season. And <laughs> Meredith wants you to buy this for Christmas. Um, put your orders in it at uh, Bookmine and we'll get you on the waiting list because right now we're waiting for more copies to arrive. Be patient with us, we'll get them out to you. It's definitely worth the read, it's worth sharing, it's worth having that conversation as, uh, was it Bianca? I'm trying to remember who, who has had this conversation with, a, no, Kira, sorry, as a result of reading this book. I, I imagine many of us will after tonight. So thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you so I'm not going to end until all of you are gone. So <laughs> great to see Bye. you. Good evening. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone. I just feel like it's rude to hit end before you, while you guys are still here. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night, good night. It was so wonderful to see how many couples were together watching. Oh, that's something we couldn't see. Yeah. Yeah, there were partners. Wonderful. Yeah. We still have a few people here waving goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, goodbye. Here we go. Your daughters have said good night. They're off to, are they both in Texas or? They were today, yeah. Today. They actually are both in Texas. They were here in Virginia for a while when my parents were sick, but they're back in Austin. And uh, I wish they would get the heck out of the state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, say good night. There they go. There they yeah, go. Thank you so much. It was very well done. Lovely. Very much for um, reaching out so that we could make this as personal as it was. I appreciate it. And Anne, what a delight to meet you. How lucky you found each other. I'm, I'm... It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this. <laughs> My pleasure. Good night. Good night, everyone.